Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you for sticking around for my final um, part of the lecture. Um, my name is John. I'm a, uh, in my final year of graduate work here in the lab of Suzanne Walker with Marina, um, where uh, we work on MRSA uh, to try to find new approaches to target this resistant bacterial infection. Um, uh, it's really great that so many of you are here and interested in this important uh, societal problem, one that we take years of time trying to, uh, to find answers to. Um, so Amy has already uh, told us, uh, we left off, Amy's told us about how um, bacteria are these small organisms that can cause infections inside humans, um, but we use antibiotics as tools to fight back against them. Um, and then Marina told us that bacteria can actually fight back. They can become res resistant through, to these antibiotics through a number of different mechanisms that she spoke about. So um, it's clear that we need new antibiotics to target this, this big threat of bacterial infection. So I'm going to talk about three questions related to finding new antibiotics. What do these new antibiotics look like? Uh, where can we find them? And how are we going to go about finding them? So um, don't be intimidated. Here are just some uh, structures for a few different antibiotics that I've selected, um, uh, which you may notice just by looking at them. You don't even have to know what the structures mean to see that they're actually all quite different looking. Um, uh, they're, they're on the same order of scale, uh, same size. So we call these antibiotics small molecules. Um, if you remember the picture from Marina's part, um, the antibiotics typically are small and fitting into the pocket of the larger protein. So uh, these are, are generally pretty small. We call them small molecules. Um, but they have pretty dramatically different structures. So how would we recognize an antibiotic if we saw one? Uh, it turns out that despite having different structures, they actually share a number of, of key properties. Uh, and so uh, one of those properties, uh, the most important, was that they hit an important bacterial process. So Amy told us about different um, important bacterial processes, such as replicating the DNA, or building the cell wall, or uh, constructing the cell membrane. All of these are important bacterial processes that antibiotics can disable. Um, antibiotics also have to be effective and specific for bacteria. Uh, we don't want them to go awry and start hitting targets inside a human being that we need to do important jobs for us. Um, Antibiotics, it would be great for them to be resistant to degradation by bacteria or the environment. Um, that way we can be sure that they um, can get to the site of the infection and then treat those bacteria. We need antibiotics to be able to get into the body and to be well tolerated by the body. We don't want them to start setting off our immune system. Um, and we want them to um, be uh, able to be dosed properly. We wouldn't want to have to take an antibiotic every 30 seconds. That wouldn't be very convenient. And finally, um, it would be great if antibiotics could be prepared in large quantities and cheaply, because um, bacterial infection is a global health problem, and there are a lot of people to treat. Um, so it turns out that there are, sorry about that. Um, it turns out that there are um, a, a number of antibiotics that are already um, available. And a lot of them come from nature. So on this pie chart, you'll see um, about 105 different antibiotics that came through the Food and Drug Administration over the course of the 24-year period between 1981 and 2005. And so I'm going to talk about the different classes of antibiotics that are in this pie chart. Um, and I'll start with ones that come directly from nature. So you've already seen an example of antibiotics developed uh, that, that, that we can find just lying around in nature. And here's that picture of Alexander Fleming's plate. Um, where the penicillium mold was uh, releasing penicillin and killing bacteria around it. Now, a petri dish isn't exactly nature, so I'll try to give you another example, and I'll turn to uh, a root of a plant. So uh, many plants develop a kind of plant cancer. Uh, there, there are these tumors that, uh, or those nodules that you may be able to see in the picture. Um, there we go. Um, and this is called crown gall disease. Um, so it turns out that this disease is commonly called by a plant pathogen, a uh, bacterium called Agrobacterium tumefaciens. Um, they don't actually have three eyes and things. <laughs> um, uh, and so there's another bacterium that lies around the environment as well called Agrobacterium radiobacter K84. It's very similar. Um, but it makes us an antibiotic called Agrocin84 that actually kills the bad bacterium. Uh, and, and farmers are known to exploit this process to um, seed their plants with the good bacterium, which can ward off the bad bacterium and prevent these plants from developing these tumors. Um, so 
this is just another example of antibiotics in nature, and, and the point that I should make is that they're, they're often found in unique environments. As Amy said, a lot of times you'll find them when bacteria are trying to compete with each other for resources or trying to communicate with each other. Uh, but scientists are on the hunt for more natural antibiotics. Uh, so they are uh, uh, running around the, the face of the planet, to the, diving to the depths of the ocean, going to the remotest part of the jungle, looking for um, novel organisms and uh, new, uh, to see if they make new useful antibiotics for us. Um, and so, um, furthermore, there are advances in, um, recent advances in science, such as genome sequencing, that help us actually look inside an organism's genome and see whether, it, predict whether it'll make an antibiotic or not. So, you'll see at the bottom of the slide are some uh, sea anemones, um, and it turns out that uh, scientists were able to look inside their genome, see which genes they had, and just by looking at that sequence of genes, they can predict whether they'll make one kind of antibiotic or another. Um, but the majority of antibiotics that we use in hospitals are not actually directly from nature. They're nature-inspired. Uh, we actually modify them uh, to make them more useful for us. And so a good example of this are the cephalosporins. You may have heard of them before. The, the first cephalosporin uh, was discovered from the fungus acrimonium in 1948. I mean, it has that basic chemical structure. Um, uh, since that time, uh, scientists have been able to uh, modify this structure. Just, uh, I just put red circles here just to see how, uh, show how the structure has changed slightly using chemistry. Um, and they're able to improve these, uh, this naturally occurring antibiotic to make it better. So this second generation drug, Lorocarba, is longer lasting. Um, and they've actually gone through this process over and over again. They're up to a fifth generation drug now called Septibiprol. Um, that you can see they keep modifying it, they keep adding on things and making it better and better. Now this drug can target resistant bacterial enzymes. And this was recently approved by the Food and Drug Administration in 2010. So we can extensively tailor these, uh, these antibiotics that come from nature, but we can also build antibiotics all by ourselves. Um, there's a small class of man-made antibiotics. But actually the very first antibiotic that was used uh, was called salvarsin, and this is completely synthetic. So this was discovered in 1909 by uh, Sahichiro Hata and Paul Ehrlich. It was used to treat syphilis. Uh, the one problem is that it has arsenic in it, so not a very good antibiotic, um, but I guess maybe um, it would kill your syphilis. <laughs> um, so uh, we can actually, uh, just like with uh, natural antibiotics, we can modify these man-made antibiotics to improve their abilities. And here's a great example um, where we can prevent the efflux of antibiotics, so prevent the bacteria from getting resistant to this particular antibiotic. So on the top of the slide is minocycline. It's a great um, target for these efflux pumps. In other words, these efflux pumps are really good at getting minocycline out of the bacterium so that it can't kill the bacteria. But scientists were able to modify this structure by throwing on this extra red part there, and now that drug, tidocycline, can't get pumped out of the cell anymore. It gets stuck inside, and then it can kill bacteria. So just like with modifying natural, uh, natural antibiotics to make them better, we can do this with uh, man-made antibiotics as well. So, but it's definitely clear that nature is our richest source of antibiotics. Uh, a lot of our new ones are derived from nature, but um, it takes a lot of work, a lot of chemistry, to make these structures better than they already are. Um, and by better, I mean they have some of those key properties that I mentioned. So they're safe and effective in humans, they hit bacteria, um, and they're cheap, and you can make a lot of them. Um, so I think I'll stop here for questions. <coughs> no questions? Yep? Okay, so a follow-up on the uh, uh, penicillin allergy question. You know, it seems like you hear a lot of uh, people allergic to penicillin. I'm allergic to penicillin. And uh, is there something that's part and parcel of what makes it a good uh, antibiotic that also makes it, uh, you know, people susceptible to allergies, or is this sort of an early problem with you know, you know, allergic reactions that was subsequently solved in, in new generation of antibiotics? That's a great question. So the question is, um, does uh, making an antibiotic uh, more effective or more potent um, change or make it more susceptible to causing an immune response. Um, I actually don't have a good answer for that. Um, anybody? Yeah, I mean, 
Yeah, I guess it depends. I honestly, I don't know. That's a great question. Um, I don't know if you have studied that. <laughs> they should. <laughs> yes. So um, some of the other speakers mentioned that antibiotics have to be a really particular shape to fit the right proteins in a bacteria. So how can we know exactly what changes to tack on to an existing antibiotic or to make a synthetic one? What changes, how can we know what those specific shape has to be to fit the bacteria? That is a great question. So um, the question was, um, how can we uh, pick a particular shape uh, or how can we know beforehand what shapes are good antibiotics that will fit inside the proteins that we want to block? Um, and scientists have been working on this problem for a long time. Um, they're getting better at it, but they're not, you know, they still can't predict with uh, any, a good level of certainty. Um, part of that is because our models of proteins are, are also getting better and better as, as time is going on. We can better model how they fit together. Um, but I would say that, uh, in general, the best evidence is empirical. Um, that we usually go to just see if it works in the test tube and then, then we know it's good or not. Yes? Why does a scientist uh, focus on um, bacterial phage or virus or DNA or protein instead of generating new type of uh, antibody? Okay. Because generating new type of antibody cause generating new type of mutation. Okay, so the question is, why would, uh, why would scientists focus on antibiotics? I mean, we just heard that antibiotics cause resistance. Why not focus on viruses as a way to treat uh, bacterial infections? Um, and the answer is that bacteria can also become resistant to, well, there are a number of different answers. So I'll start with first that uh, bacteria can become resistant to viruses just like they can become resistant to antibiotics. So it's not like a, a universal um, uh, cure-all. Um, secondly, um, viruses uh, are not clean. Uh, they can activate the human's immune system as well. Uh, they're much bigger than antibiotics, so uh, they're more likely to elicit an immune response uh, um, than a small molecule antibiotic. And I think the third is probably, again, an empirical answer that um, we've been using antibiotics for decades and decades, and they've been shown to work until they stop working. Um, so it, uh, I think it's a, it's a long struggle to uh, change that mindset. Um, but I will talk about some alternative approaches that scientists are, are using. There is an interaction of the between um, Eastern countries. So in my country, so people using the Right. For the treatment, there is no much Yeah. So it's the it's not this kind of simple. Find virus to make it yes, yes. So um, the, the second point was that, yes, um, other countries outside the U.S. have been turning to uh, viral uh, bacteria viruses as a therapeutic option. Um, and uh, scientists are working on improving it. Um, and I think the more they improve it, the more likely we would be able to adopt it as a potential therapeutic approach. So I think. I'll move on. Yep. You guys can ask more questions later. Where am I now? Here. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I told you about some of these key properties that antibiotics have to have. So now I'm going to tell you about how uh, scientists can go looking for them. If we have an antibiotic sitting in a tube, how do we know if it works or not? And so there's two main approaches that scientists use. The first is called target-based screening. Um, and this is really just having a pure, uh, uh, an isolated system where you throw in your antibiotic in a test tube and you throw in the protein that you're interested in targeting into the test tube and you see whether it blocks the activity of that protein. Um, in contrast, um, scientists can also use a whole cell screening approach where they are again throwing that antibiotic inside the test tube but now they throw in a whole bacteria and see does the bacteria live or die. Um, so scientists need to do this on a large scale. They have a lot of different potential antibiotics to test, especially if they're combing the environment looking for new ones. Um, so they have developed ways to do this in, many, in, in uh, these experiments in, in succession with a large uh, volume of material. That's called high throughput screening, in case you've heard of that. Um, so each of these approaches has its own pluses and minuses. And so as I said for the target-based screening, the goal is to stop the activity of whatever your protein is um, that you're targeting. Uh, we want to block it from doing its important job for the bacteria. So the benefit of this approach is that we already know um, if we look in that test tube and the protein stops, 
um, we know that that's a one-on-one -on -one interaction between that antibiotic and that protein, um, a specific interaction. But then the question that remains is, well, you're in this isolated, purified system. Can you bring that into bacteria now? Would it still work? Um, whereas on the other side, um, your goal was to kill those bacteria in the tube. Um, we, if the, the bacteria die in the tube, we know it works. Um, it's killing the bacteria. But in that case, we don't know why it works. Um, it's, a, it's a big black box. So um, if it's so easy to kill bacteria um, using these kinds of experiments and tools uh, to assess antibiotics, um, how come we don't have more antibiotics? And so I'm just going to give you a case study that came out in 2009 um, that was written by some head scientist from a prominent pharmaceutical company uh, whose name I've removed from the presentation. So um, this company analyzed 530,000 different small molecules looking for which ones could be antibiotics or not. They broke up their experiments into two different parts. So as I said, um, uh, or 67 of their experiments were using that target-based approach with purified proteins. And three of their experiments were done using the whole bacterial cells. They found only five worked. So that's a success rate of 0 0.0009%. Um, and that cost them over $70 million and took over six years. And they're not the only company. There were you know, tens of others of companies that were doing the same exact thing. Um, in the same exact search. So why did they fail and how can, they, how can we fix this? Uh, the head scientist that wrote this case study uh, came up with a few different answers um, that they thought. So at first they thought, well, maybe they didn't, we didn't look at the right small molecules. Uh, 530,000 seems like a big collection, but actually it's really small compared to the possible number of, of, of small molecules out there. Um, and uh, maybe they were trying to target the wrong protein, so they focused on one particular set that they thought would be important for bacteria. Um, but there is debate about what is, which is the best target for an antibiotic to have, and what are other ways that we can kill bacteria. And finally, they were looking for one antibiotic to do a very tough job of killing a bacteria, uh, a bacterial cell. And um, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, it already. The question already came up about combination therapy, so. I'm sorry this is cut off. It's really because this is on a new computer. Um, but there's more than one way to skin this cat. I'm going to tell you about some alternative strategies that we can equip ourselves in this arms race uh, back and forth between bacteria and humans. So maybe killing bacteria is a high bar. Um, maybe we don't really have to kill them. We just have to stop them from causing an infection in human beings. And so one place to turn would be about, uh, to these virulence factors that Amy mentioned in the first part of the presentation. Um, so she talked about these different parts of the bacterium that are useful in invading a human cell and causing disease. Um, these adhesins that stick to the cell, um, the toxins that they release to kill the cells. So maybe we can come up with antibiotics that would block some of these processes. They wouldn't kill a bacterium outright, but they would prevent uh, a, a bacterium from uh, killing a human cell. And so scientists are working on these kinds of approach, this kind of approach, um, but it is a little bit of controversial. It hasn't yet been demonstrated to work in human beings, but they're on it. Um, and one example of a, of a small molecule that works in this way is pilicide. Um, so you can see those filamentous structures on the outer surface of the E. coli cylindrical bacterium. Um, those filamentous structures are called pili. They're used to bind to human cells. And if you treat with this small molecule pilicide, it gets rid of the pili. And now E. coli can no longer adhere to human cells. So it looks like a promising approach. Um, another alternative would be to use more than one drug at once. Um, and I'll, so I'll give you an example of this, um, a way that scientists can actually directly target resistance mechanisms um, by using two drugs at once. So specifically, the resistance mechanism of blocking enzymatic degradation of antibiotics. So many of you may have heard of the drug Augmentin. A lot of us may have taken it at one point or the other. It's actually a two-drug approach. Um, so recall Marina told us about beta-lactamases. Um, they took amoxicillin, which we said uh, targets the cell wall. It causes bacterial death. Um, these beta-lactamases can chew up that amoxicillin um, and inactivate it. So now it can no longer cause bacterial cell death. Its structure has been altered. It no longer fits into that lock of the enzyme. Um, but augmentin is a combination of amoxicillin with clavulanic acid. So this clavulanic acid actually blocks the beta-lactamase. Now amoxicillin no longer gets broken down, and it can move on to do what it's supposed to do, to target the cell wall and cause bacterial death. 
So this is an example of a combination approach that we use today um, to, um, uh, to make our antibiotics uh, return to being useful and bacteria no longer resistant to them. And finally, I'll just talk about uh, briefly about an approach that we're currently using in the Walker Lab um, since called synthetic lethality. Uh, we can really think of this as a one-two punch to kill bacteria. So imagine that you're interested in targeting two different proteins in a bacteria. Um, if they have both of those proteins, the bacteria lives and it's happy and it's great. Uh, maybe uh, you can block one of those proteins, protein number two, uh, with an antibiotic, um, but the bacteria is still healthy, it, it, can, it can live. Uh, maybe you can block another protein with a different antibiotic, protein number one, and the bacteria still lives and it's happy. Um, but if you've tried blocking both of these proteins at the same time, uh, maybe that could kill the bacteria. Uh, and that would be really useful. Uh, so this would be a way to use a combination approach and to multiply our number of targets. Um, if we can find pairs like this, where if we knock them both out at the same time, they kill the bacteria. So this is an approach that we're working on uh, today. So um, just to summarize, this is a very complex problem. So we started with uh, focusing on the bacteria. We told you what they were about. Um, how they cause this disease in patients. Um, then we talked about um, how we can throw antibiotics at those bacteria, um, but then bacteria can fight back. Um, now I've just told you about how researchers are trying to fight back as well. They're trying to develop new antibiotics. They're trying to look in new places. But these aren't the only parts of the problem. Um, we have to uh, encourage doctors to use and patients that they treat to use antibiotics in a responsible fashion and to use them correctly. Um, we need to work with the government to um, improve uh, funding for researchers, that'd be great, um, uh, uh, and regulation on the new antibiotics that are being developed and coming out to make sure that they're safe. And it, uh, at the top of all this problem, of course, this requires a lot of money, um, a lot of work. Um, but we're hopeful uh, with a lot of the advances that we just talked about. So. Just to summarize, um, I've told you about how a major pharmaceutical company failed to identify new antibiotics despite a lot of work and a lot of money. It's a hard thing to do. Um, but recent advances in science, so new chemistry to build new molecules, um, new approaches uh, to target virulence or to target or use drugs in combination um, can, can equip us in this problem. So I think I'll stop here for, or I'll first before I take questions. I think we should definitely say thank you um, to our uh, directors of Science in the News, Amy and Chelsea, and to <laughs> to our lecture coordinator, Vinny, who definitely helped us bring all of this together uh, over the past week and develop those handouts that you guys got. Um, <laughs> Um, to our labs and friends um, that, that helped us prepare, and, and, and of course, most important to all of you for coming. Thank you so much. So we'll take a few questions, all three of us. Yes? In the beginning, you introduced the type of vaccine, right? Are these different as a pathogen? Or, like, are they different to build up resistance? Are you trying to kill them? Which one? It's a great question. I'll take it. Okay. So the question was, um, how uh, are gram positives and gram negatives different in this problem of uh, antibiotic resistance? Um, which is easier to kill? Which is easier to kill? Okay. So we'll talk about all this. So um, I would start off by saying that. Um, uh, sorry, I need to get <laughs> The first part was with the gram positive versus gram negative antibiotic resistance, right? Yeah. Um, and there are some antibiotics that are good at targeting gram positives, and there are some that are good at targeting gram negatives. And uh, if you remember, the gram positives have that really thick cell wall right at the top. And that's really bad if you want to get all the way inside the cell or if you're targeting the membrane. But if you're targeting the cell wall, it's right there and it's more on it, more exposed. Um, but if you have a gram-negative, you have a thinner cell wall, but you have two membranes. 
And depending on the properties of your antibiotic, it might not be, it could either be really good at getting through those two membranes or it could be really bad. So it definitely varies. Um, the second part was pathogenicity, whether or not they're very good at different being pathogens, and it's the same. Some are good and some are bad. I would like to know what is the risk of what would too much antibiotic cause for your body? Okay, so the question was, is there a risk with taking too many, too much antibiotic? Um, and definitely, uh, uh, I would start by saying that antibiotics uh, are can kill. Um, some antibiotics are broad spectrum. I don't know if you remember that term that we mentioned, where they can kill multiple bacteria. Often, either uh, through their direct action or by killing one bacterium, they can have effects on your natural body's uh, bacterial. Uh, diversity. Um, so it, there can be a, a downside just for you personally in terms of having side effects um, by taking too many antibiotics. But there's also uh, the side effect on society of uh, promoting the spread of resistance um, by misusing the drug. Let's look at that the last sort of question. And uh, anyone like to chat more with the speakers, you can come down to the front. Um, so with that, I'd like to invite you to um, submit to your survey so that we know what we're going to improve on um, and to make repeat it once again.